Mansions of Madness is a cooperative 1-5 to player adventure board game in style of Lovecrafting fantasy horror. If you don't know what Lovecrafting horror is, then imagine you are a fresh college graduate entering the workforce for the first time. But to define it clearly, Lovecrafting horror is mere human beings facing off against monsters and creatures of the unknowable. Not simply unknown, but the unknowable. That being said, Mansions of Madness does an excellent job balancing this narrative theme with gameplay. So let's get started. The game of Mansions of Madness takes anywhere between 1-8 to eight hours, and this depends on the scenario being played and type of players in the game. Habitual RPG looters and narrative driven players are at risk for taking longer turns. Of course, you can skip all this and just play solo, not that I don't have any friends or anything. Setting up the board is pretty easy, but it will take a significant amount of space. The game often starts off with one revealed board piece and all the players on it. As the game progresses and players explore the scenarios, additional board pieces are added. With some scenarios, this board can become fairly large, and at the top of the tiny little deck of cards and monster figurines that you have, you have a pretty, uh, monstrous setup. In the first edition of Matches of Madness, the game requires a dedicated player to manage all the monsters and storytelling. However, with the second edition, the player is freed from prison and these roles are relegated to a free app. And of course, the app is needed to play this game. It can be found on iOS, Android, and Steam. In the beginning, you pick a scenario and your investigators. All the investigators have their own backstories, unique numerical stats, such as health, sanity, strength, and agility, and they all have some kind of special abilities. Then it comes down to the Hunger Game phase, where everyone fights over distributed items for the scenario. My recommendation, give the pointy knife to the most aggressive YOLO player in your group. Then after some narration and backstory, you're thrown into the game. The game is divided into two primary phases, the Investigator phase and the Mythos phase. During the Investigator phase, all players have two actions and may collectively take their actions in any order. For example, if a monster is in a puzzle room with Stabity Rod and me, Stabity Rod being an ally, he may go ahead and use both of his actions to do battle with the monsters. Or he may go ahead and use one action to battle the monster and wait to see what I would do. I may then go ahead and duel the monster, deliver the last blow, and then take all the glory for myself. Stabity Rod, since the monster is dead, he may then go ahead and use his remaining action to try to solve the puzzle in the room, or he may decide to go ahead and get angry at me because I took all the glory and attack me. Some actions players can take include, but are definitely not limited to, movement, object interacting, solving a puzzle in your inventory, challenging a monster to a duel, barricading yourself and crying for safety in the comfort of an isolated room, activating your special abilities, and talking to people. Once all actions are done, it is time for the Mythos phase. During the Mythos phase, the game takes a thematic environmental action. This can be dropping fireballs on all players in an outdoor area, to humming a subtle song menacingly at everyone, to forcing an investigator to attack their own allies. I'm not even joking about that last one. That actually happened to me. Then the games will often spawn monsters ranging from just a simple normal human dude to a monstrosity tentacle monster of death. And then move them and then attack accordingly. After the monster moves and attack, the game will do what is called a horror check against all investigators in range. Range is defined as up to three spaces away and not obstructed by doors or similar items. Remember this because range also applies to you if you're shooting a gun or casting a ranged spell. It can mean a difference between life or death. If there are multiple monsters in a room, then you do a horror check against the strongest one. So if a human dude and monstrosity tentacle monster is in the same room staring you down, most likely you'll probably ignore the human dude and freak out over the giant tentacle monster. Meanwhile, this is a good time to talk about how the majority of the game does its checks, battles, and a dual health system. Unlike most games where you have a single health pool, Mansions of Madness uses two types of health, physical and sanity. When you physically get hurt, you draw face up from this red beating heart, unless stated otherwise. Same thing when you begin to lose your sanity, except with this blue pulsing brain. These damage you suffer can have all kinds of effect, from taking extra damage to being unable to carry items. But they're only effective if they're face up in your inventory. If they're face down, they only count as damage. Each of these cards you have in your possession, whether face up or face down, counts against your health or sanity. So, for example, if you have three red cards and one blue card, that means you have 3 physical damage and 1 sanity damage. If you run out of health, however, you don't immediately die. You suffer a major trauma, represented by these cards, 
and remove all of the corresponding face down cards from your inventory to reset your damage back to almost zero. Not quite. These major trauma cards are often highly detrimental to the success of your team. Some of these cards even change your own objectives, so it's best to avoid getting these cards. Oftentimes, if you lose your second health bar, you permanently die and are eliminated from the game. When a player is eliminated from the game, the remaining players have exactly one more turn to try and finish their main objective, or else everyone loses. So, you know, watch each other's back. Many actions, battles, and horror situations are often checked against the investigator stats. For example, I investigate a fridge with a padlock that I want to tear open. I'll do a check against my strength that requires two successes. If my investigator isn't very swole, with a strength of two for example, I roll two dice. If my investigator never ever skips legs day and is swole beyond all belief like Hugh Jackman, then I have a strength of five and I roll five dices. Of these rolls, the star counts as a success, blanks counts as failures, and magnifying glasses means I may spend one clue token, which are these, to turn the dice into a success. If I succeed, I'll tear open the padlock to find some protein power and some additional clue tokens to get buff. If I fail, I'll hurt my dainty hands against intimidating padlock and lose one health. Battle is the same way. You pick a monster from the app screen, choose your weapon from Stabity Sword, to I'm gonna be smart and use a gun, to I'm not smart, I'm gonna go wish for death by punching. Then follow the checks on the apps. Finally, there's the puzzle section. Occasionally, throughout the game, you'll run into different types of puzzle that needs to be solved on the app. There are many different types of puzzles, such as sliding puzzles and numerical puzzles, and you have a specific amount of moves based on your stats to solve it. Recommendation, let the person who is actually good at solving puzzles work on the puzzles. Because by rule set, right, only the interacting person is able to see the puzzle. Of course, if you're screen sharing onto a giant TV, that becomes significantly harder. Not that that happened to us. So what are my thoughts about Mansions of Madness? It's a fun game, but don't take this the wrong way when I say this game isn't for everyone. Those who would have fun off the top of my head are RPG fanatics, especially those who enjoy picking up loot, people who love exploring worlds like Elder Scroll players, uh, co-op game nuts, people who enjoy role-playing the characters and saying, Hath Doth found my weapon. And most importantly, people who can invest a significant amount of time into a scenario. This is because some scenarios are very long and while there is a save function, you don't want to lose momentum in a scenario. There are other situations where I would not recommend it as well. For example, if you have a person in a group who constantly hijacks the co-op elements. Having a person doing it every now and then isn't too bad when everyone's a squabbling headless chicken and you're trying to aim at a specific direction. But having a person who does it consistently to the detriment of everyone else's experience kind of makes you wish that the monstrous tentacle monster was kind of real. Additionally, this game can be massive. It is by far the largest game in my inventory and some scenarios literally sprawled across an entire table. So if space is an issue, such as your only play area is a college dorm room, I cannot recommend this game. Design is well done. The game does an excellent job capturing Lovecraft in horror. The creepy music that plays from the app while you explore the board, the detailed artwork on all the characters, the hanging appendages on all the monsters, the flavor text on certain cards, all of these add to the atmosphere, and the game really sets up the mood. It has smooth narration at the beginning of the game, and eventually when your group dies, it has a smooth narration detailing the epilogue as well. A strange feeling crawls across your skin as you step off the bus into the small Massachusetts town of Innsmouth. Everywhere you go, you can feel the gaze of the locals' unblinking, watery eyes on your back. In every alleyway, on every street corner, you can feel the presence of the stooped, pallid residents following you, watching from a distance. The loss of your fellow investigator leaves the group in shambles. You struggle to continue the investigation, but the loss of your ally proves devastating. You flee the scene, leaving the matter unresolved. Manch of the Madness does a solid job pitting you against an unknown being and feel powerless to stop them. And the only hope you have against this crushing darkness is a red die. And the RNG goddess, who is surprisingly fickle and powerful. Once I've seen a man punch down a full health Cthulhu with nothing but his bare fist as he effortlessly danced around all of his attack. And when questioned later, it turned out he was a disciple of the Church of RNG. 
but outside of RNGs taking a hand in your dice roll, the game is pretty balanced. Some characters are better suited for some scenarios, but you'll have a great time regardless as you develop different types of strategies for tackling on a map and improv in different types of situations. What's interesting of note is that the win conditions for these scenarios can actually change depending on which actions are done in the game. And the game tries to keep things fresh by offering different types of scenarios and different game types such as protecting the VIP to solving a who's done it type of mystery. The quality of components to use are sturdy and of pretty high quality, but if there's a gripe with the component quality it's that it's a little bit difficult to go ahead and put the model on the stand. Pricing is about 90 US dollars and I'd definitely say it's worth the price. There are DLCs on the apps for about $5 so if you run out scenarios there's a slew of additional scenarios you can buy. I haven't bought any of the DLCs so I can't exactly comment on them, but in my research I did discover that they are not cross-platform compatible. So if you buy from Steam you will not be able to get it onto iOS for example. So make sure that if you do decide to buy any DLC that you will commit to one platform. The other major concern I have with this game is replayability. Once you've gone through a scenario a couple times, you have an idea of what's coming, and even though the game tries to randomize it, you kind of expect what happens with the big bad guy. This could impact story type of players. Regardless, there are hundreds of hours of gameplay from this thing, and I'd definitely say it's worth the money. It's a great game. I give it an RN Jesus punching out Cthulhu out of 10. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, share it with friends, link to the game is in the description below. Purchasing the game through the link really helps. And as always, See you next time. Uh, did Tom just punch out Cthulhu?